and and contemplation and reflection. You listen to again, even if your mind says, no, no, I have already heard it. No, the moment your mind says, I have heard it, so ask your mind what you know, what you have understood. So that is the listening and learning, contemplation, reflection, and the practice is the key to the, that is what the first step is. So why it happens, and then we will come to the first step. And I have told you a couple of times, it is known as the Satsang. Satsang, Sanskrit word. Sang means company, Sat means existence and the truth, the company of the truth. So how the company of the truth materializes by listening and learning to these principles. So if you are constantly listening and learning, plus contemplation and reflection, you will find a sense of detachment and that is what the changes you find in your daily life because that sense of detachment has entered into the mind. And that is why you don't feel so much of anxious and upset. So that sense of non-attachment, if it continues, what happens if the sense... Can I, of, can I, can I, Gurish, can I stop you right there? Yeah. If we are really detached, we are happy. But if I okay. feel detached with a sense of expectations from the world outside, so it means the attachment and a strong clinging is still living in the mind. That is why I feel weird. Okay. Are you not detached with your neighbor? Are you not detached with your kitchen? Are you not detached with your bedroom? But if I have a sense of expectations with the people, with the situation, with the thing and event that is living inside, deeper inside my mind, then I will definitely feel weird. I feel weird. You know, my neighbor didn't talk to me today. And still I see that I'm detached. What kind of a detachment is this? This kind of an attachment is still the clinging is there. It is not detachment. Detachment is happiness. <clears throat> you go to the restroom, are you still attached to the restroom? Detached to the restroom? Yes, I'm detached. You never think about it. But when you feel weird, oh, I have to go back to the restroom again. That is the feeling of the weirdness and still detached. This is not a real detachment. So it means a lot of impressions are still working in the, in, the, in the mind. So by how it changes, by constant listening and learning, listening and learning, contemplation and reflection and a practice, the deeper layers of the mind changes. And now you say, why my mind, you are, why are you thinking of the kitchen? I just had my dinner. Stop it. And you stop it, you find the sense of detachment and calmness. That, we are talking of that detachment. We are not talking of the detachment that someone is, uh, someone is holding you and you say that you are, I'm detached. Detachment it gives you a sense of freedom. It doesn't give you a sense of weirdness. Okay. So from that sense of the detachment, what happens then comes the sense of dispassion. So dispassion and judgmental are two things. In judgmental, we still cling to the likes and dislikes. In dispassion, uh, my mind says yes, my mind has likes and dislikes, and but I'm still, you know, I'm not worried about anything. I'm not concerned about this. So that sense of dispassion comes. Dispassion is more filled with the joy in your mind. Joy in mind. 
Oh, this car is so good. I went yesterday to saw the Lincoln SUV and it's a good car. So he asked me that it's really, do you like it? I said, I very much like it. So are you going to buy it? I said, no. Why no? Because you are giving me a higher price. So I will analyze, I will find out the price somewhere else, and then I will come back to you. But I promise if I buy a Lincoln, I will definitely come to you. No, no, we will uh, bring the price down. I said, let me know. So that is a state of dispassion. So you work in a state of dispassion. You may like millions of things, then what? So you can appreciate the beauty of liking, etc., thing, a person, but no, no. You're not in, you don't, that liking should not create neither the weirdness, nor a craving, nor a sense of repeat thoughts. Then it is definitely detachment and dispassion. Then what happens? The mind lives in freedom, <clears throat> natural state of the steady. And that natural state of the steadiness, what happens then? The, you can be in the state of meditation anywhere, anytime. Anywhere, anytime. Buddha took mm. seven years. You know, we talk of the Buddha. No, no, Buddha talks of one minute of mindfulness. Hey, you haven't seen how much effort and the labor he put for six years, he left the house. You are attending only one session every once a week. Six years means seven, 24 by seven, six years. So if you calculate one hour per week as compared to the six years of the Buddha, you have to spend 50 years. And then he reached to that state of mindfulness. And we read the one phrase, oh, mindfulness is non-practice. You just close your eye, focus on the breath. It was so easy for the Buddha to do it. Even the Buddha, it took him six years, seven years. Seven years means 24 by seven. He was totally immersed into that. And we say, no, 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 just five minutes of rest. You close your eyes, focus on your breath, and it's done. Hi. What, what did he, where did, where did he go for seven years? Seven years, he met almost, I would say, I remember names wow. of two masters, three masters. Alar Kalam was the last master. Before that, there was another master who gave him the intensive training of the Hatha Yoga. Another master who asked him to do the fasting, stand on one foot, live in the forest, take one meal a day. And like this, he went to many, many masters and he did everything religiously. What happened after the seven years? Seven years, he was awakened. He had the self-knowledge. <laughs> what happened after seven years? What should happen? That, that no, is, I just didn't, I didn't know what he did. Did he go back home? Did he die? I didn't know what no, happened. No, no, yes, yes. So after seven years, first time, the master, who was his master? Well, I'll, I'll remember, then I'll tell you. So with the, that master, he had his five friends. So there were six people who were living and getting training under this Hatha Yoga and the Tantra Yoga Master. And it appears that Tantra Yoga Master was not in the state of realization. So he was giving all the crazy practices, not in a right manner. So he, some incident happened, so he left that master and he went to the Alar Kalam, the last master who guided him. So when he got awakened, he ran after, he ran to the forest and he asked all the five of his friends, come, I will give you the masses. So that is known as the first 
talk he gave to his five friends. What five friends? He spoke about the four noble truths. This world is the suffering. There is a cause of the suffering. There is a state which is devoid of suffering, means the full of peace and happiness. And the fourth message was there is a way. I, I'm just briefing the message. He spoke about, if, if I see the literature, he perhaps spoke about three to four hours. And all the five of his friends followed him. They became his students. And out of which he developed, he discovered internally the eight four noble paths. Which he taught in India to kings, to beggars, to poor, to everyone, to villagers, to the urban people for more than 45 years. I'm answering your question what he did after that. Yeah. He taught for more than 45 years. He was perhaps the one of the great serving masters. So at that time, the population of India was hardly half a million. Really? really. Wow. And half a million, and for, for half a million, he taught how many? 45 years. He visited all the villages, remote areas. <clears throat> kings. Many kings became his students. And ultimately, those kings also became monks they realized. And those kings and his ministers went to the far off places, far away from India. And that is how the Buddhism spread into China. From China, it went into Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, Burma, and all the Southeast Asian, Sri Lanka, Southeast Asian country. Those kings became the monks. Because he taught for 45 years. So that was that is what he did for 45 years. Come back to our topic. Leave this. What Buddha did, you know, it is none of our business. You know, just, you know, we have well, some... I, I, just wanna ask, I do want to ask one thing. Or yeah. is there a difference? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's another question you're asking me in the simple answer. So let's have this question and answer it in the first session. So, you know, Eastern wisdom is 10,000 years old. Buddha is 25 plus 2000, 25 plus 23, almost 5,000 years old. So those texts, teachers, and teachings were always available in India much before the Buddha was born. That is the first thing to understand. Now, I explain these principles based on my understanding, my realization, based on my teachings of my master. So from where my master learned it? From his master from uh, where his master learned, from his master, and ultimately it goes to the ultimate source of the Eastern wisdom, which is 10,000 years old. So now you can get better that from where the Buddha learned. Buddha learned from the existing masters. That, that's what I referenced. So ultimately, so, so from where those masters learned? From the Eastern wisdom. So ultimately, yeah. the teachings belongs to the Eastern wisdom. From those earliest masters, the text and teachings were available. Now I have reached to that state. Based on my mental interpretation and a revelation, I explain the same principles in a different way. But ultimately, the teaching is the same. 
So we, as a teacher, we belong to the Eastern wisdom. We don't belong to any religion. We don't belong to any religion. So even in Buddhism, you have three main sects. Every sect has another five or six divisions, like the Christianity. Uh, you have Orthodox and Protestant, and you have Seventh-day Adventist Church, and you have Methodist, and long list. But the one source is the Jesus. And this, so this, that is, but we don't confine ourselves to a particular sect or a religion or a dogma and a belief. Why? That is the teaching of the Eastern wisdom. Eastern wisdom says when you are awakened, you are not confined to any sect, dogma, belief, and religion. Once you are awakened, you will have your own individual expression based on the same principles. Based on the same principle is the same. Whether you say it's a real self, whether you say total nothingness, devoid, whether you say complete end of suffering, whether you say awakening, whether you say nirvana, whether you say self-knowledge, whether you say self-realization. So we have all these words are explained differently with a different expression in the Eastern West. So there are teachers, another point that needs to be understood, there are teachers who strictly adheres to the teachings and the principles and the concepts. So there are other teachers who deviated a bit. How they deviated a bit like Buddhism, they deviated a bit that there is no real self. It is only emptiness. And then what happened? So then there were great masters who strictly adhered to that teachings after the Buddha, uh, after the Buddha taught and left for after 45 years, almost to from the 2000, from the 4,500 years, there was another master who debated, who made the Buddhist students understand the real teacher, real Buddhist monks, made them understand this is the st you have to strictly adhere to the teaching. So many Buddhist monks converted again. They realized that this is the mistake which happened, and they again started following the tradition. So why we are so confident? For the last two ten thousand years, these principles remain the same. So those teachers who strictly adhere to this teaching, there is no fear of losing anything. That is what the master taught us. My master belongs to that tradition. He said, don't engage yourself in that there is a God. If someone stresses that there is a God, you say that, yes, there is a God. If second person comes and he says there is no God, you say there is no God. Why? They are not seekers. <laughs> they are just <laughs> arguing. They are arguing. So don't enter into the argument for the sake of argument. So many people believe, and many executives say that, I don't believe in God. I said, I also don't believe in God. We both are friends now. <laughs> are you ready to learn? <laughs> so we don't follow that cult, dogma, belief, you know, crazy stuff. There is a rationalization based on false argument. And there is a reasoning based on the cause and effect. You see the principle. So when the reasoning is based on the cause and effect relationship, you follow the tradition. I met you. I knew, knew you. I lived with you for a couple of weeks, months. And now I can firmly say, I don't believe you. 
that will make a sense. There is a cause and effect relationship. Now the guy comes who doesn't know anything, who has not met the God, and who says, I don't know the God. It is a rationalization. It is not reasoning. So that is why you see those who claim they are a cheese or those who claim they are cheese, they have the same lifestyle. <laughs> those who say, I don't believe in God, and those who say, I believe in God, I don't see any difference. So that is why it is not, it is not good to argue with them. Oh, we just leave it. You know, you know I don't know anything. No, but you said that you don't believe in God. I said, yes, I said that, but I'm sorry. Do you believe in God? Yes, I believe. So I also believe in God from today because you said me so. We don't argue. We are taught like this. We, we don't go for rationalization. Yes, are you ready to learn? Are you ready to understand? We will give you the cause and effect relationship. Why cause and effect relationship? Because it gives you a Proper right understanding. Proper and right understanding. Everything is understanding and the knowledge relies, depends on the cause and effect. Oh, there is a darkness, switch on the light. Cause and effect. And if you say there is a darkness, so the darkness has entered from nowhere. So let me bring, a, bring my bag and uh, put the darkness into the bag and throw it out. It will never happen. That is rationalization. We don't go for rationalization. We just avoid. We, we agree with everyone. We have no issue. We have no problem. We have no problem. We don't fight with those people. So we are taught to follow the right path. If the one is wrong, why should I again try to prove that uh, wrong? he is wrong? We don't go for that. If you are wrong, okay. uh, and if you insist, if you insist you are crazy, we say yes. Don't be crazy, we agree with you. But why, why do you say that if it's not true? Why well, say if you are speaking a lie, how can I convert your lie into the truth? So I can, I can only use your lie to get rid of that lie. Okay. We are taught reasoning. We are not taught rationalization. That's what I have been talking to you. No, I know. We are taught how to reason and reason with the right logic. A person reasons with the wrong logic, there cannot be any answer. I gave an example. I lived with you for a couple of weeks and months, and now I come home and I say, now I believe you. Why? I experienced. Now a guy who neither knows the God exists or who nor he knows the God does not exist and who comes and says, I don't believe in. It's a wrong logic. So the wrong logic has to be merged with the wrong logic only. You cannot have a right logic over the wrong one. It will never you cannot solve the problem. Sure. So, so you cannot say that I spoke a lie. No, I, I, why should I speak a lie? You say I don't believe in God. Have you seen the word? No, I know it. So I also don't believe in God. I follow him. The rationalization stops. At least we both live in the uh, live in peace. Rationalization causes the worries, rationalization causes the anxiety, duality, and a conflict. Reasoning does not cause any problem because you follow the cause and effect relationship, you have an understanding. So there was a person 
uh, <coughs> uh, there was a person in the 8th century, 7th century, yeah, whose name was Mandan Mishra, who hailed from my native state of Bihar, a great scholar, a great Buddhist master, a great monk, whose wife was also a great monk, and who was spreading the teachings of the Buddhism. And then there is another master from the southern India came whose name was Shankaracharya. There is another point that you need to understand. I wanted to pick up one thing, but this is also good. So that dialogue, which took the question and answer and the debate, but before that, I will tell you, in ancient India, and still it happens, amongst uh, the serious monks and masters. So there is a very healthy debate that I, I explain this principle in this way. Second master says, I explain this principle in this way. This will result into a self-knowledge. This will also result into a self-knowledge. So these two masters sit on a dais. Thousands of people are there, they debate. And there is a five or six member committee, again, of the higher monks. They don't fight, but they debate. And they either they come to the conclusion that both the expression leads to the same goal. They both are winners. And if one does not find the cause and effect relationship, the defeated guy becomes the disciple of the winner with all humility and respect. That tradition is there. So what happened? This Mandan Mishra, I told you, he was a Buddhist monk and the debated, debate started. Who was made the judge? That is the beauty of this tradition. Once you listen to these stories, you will say, wow, his wife was made the judge. The Buddhist monk wife was made the judge. So does the opposite party agree? Yes, he agreed. Why he agreed? Because she was a great monk. She was enlightened. And that women monk decided against is her husband. Can you imagine? Decided against her husband. Because when you live into that state of the consciousness, you don't see the preferences, likes, and dislikes. And then what happened? Both husband and wife became the disciple of this master. Who wrote this text? This is what we are learning. <laughs> <laughs> This is the summary of the Upanishads. This is the text. This is how the debate continues. Even now, the debate continues. <clears throat> debate continues. But it's a very healthy debate. Debate is full of love, kindness, compassion. It is not out of reaction, violence. It's not a question that, you know, who, who will... Uh, who will be the winner? They, 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 they promise, they take a vow that let the knowledge be victorious. That is what the knowledge of the Eastern West is. And it is still prevalent in some parts of India. <coughs> now what happened? So disciples of both these masters, they recorded the entire conversation. The book is available. Why the book is available? So that I can understand. I can remove my doubt. It is not who is the winner, but I can grasp the knowledge rightly. So that book is available. It book is known as the dialogue between these two masters. And the both were at the top of their intelligence and the wisdom.
So what we are listening, you know, at the surface level, you know, some cult dogma belief, that is that has less to do with the Eastern wisdom. It is totally independent. Knowledge does not belong to any religion, cult, dogma, person. Many inventions done in U.S., it belongs to the entire humanity. That is a knowledge. Well, America doesn't say don't use cell phone because I invented it. I don't allow you to use it. That is that knowledge. It's very open. But to receive that subjective knowledge, we need a sense of detachment and a dispassion. Without detachment and a dispassion, you cannot receive, you cannot experience that knowledge. You cannot experience that. So I told you that, so one of the 200 books this master has written, we are studying only the one book which he summarized the entire teachings in 40 steps. And it is known as the Sadhana Panchakam. Panchakam means five verses. Panchakam means five. And so he wrote the entire summary in five verses. Five verses means every verse has four lines, 20 lines. <clears throat> it can be written on A4 size paper. Can you understand the genius of this guy who summarized everything that is written in more than 2,000 books only in 20 verses? That is his genius. That was the level of his master. In 20 lines, he completed, he says, this is the journey. <clears throat> so what we are doing, what we crazy people are doing, we are picking up one step and then we explain it with reference to the other texts in teaching. That is why listening and learning from a teacher is required. Because if you read the 20 lines, you said, okay, I have learned it. What happened? I still have the same problem of fear, anxiety. Mm -hmm. So the teacher is required. Teacher is required to understand, but that teacher should also be well-versed with the entire tradition. <laughs> if the teacher is not well-versed with the entire tradition, how he can teach? He should also have been taught by the traditional teacher. So the, now you see the traditional teacher, it means there is a tradition continues. The knowledge tradition continues. Who knows out of you and other people uh, will commit to this knowledge. Even don't leave, leave, no need to leave the profession. So you carry forward the same tradition. Who knows? We are not concerned that who carry this torch further. Why? That knowledge is absolute knowledge that will remain ever existent. My master used to say, I need only one person who understand and grasp this knowledge. He will carry forward. I don't need 5,000 followers. We, we once you are settled into that knowledge, you don't worry about it. You go on explaining, you go on teaching and passing on this knowledge to the people. Who knows who becomes the committed to this knowledge and carry forward that knowledge? Who understands that? Who understands the essence of this? So we are not concerned about it. In that tradition, when if it continued for 10,000 years, it will still continue. <laughs> it has to continue. 
That is the power of the mouth. That is the power of the wisdom. It has it. The way these principles are explained and one, there are more than 10,000 masters lived for, during these 10,000 years. They continue the tradition they have left. The tradition still continues. Whether I and you live or not, the tradition will continue. That wisdom will continue. And that wisdom is free from the cult, dogma, belief, conditioning, ignorance. It's pure knowledge. So that's why we don't enter into the argument with, you know, Buddhism and the cult and the dogma, belief and the religion. No, no, no. They are at the surface level. <laughs> we, we respect everyone. I used to go to Methodist Church in New Jersey. That lady always loved me, you know, that priest and what you say in the priest. And she said, no, no, you have to come and talk. And then I used to go to Quakers. I remember Quakers. Are you aware of the Quakers? No, it's Quak Quakers is another sect of Christianity. Um. And uh, they loved me so much. And I said, I'm only talking about the peace and happiness. I only talk about the God minus any label. And they loved it. And then I went to Seventh-day Adventist Church. So there they, they have a music and they have a continuous singing. <coughs> so I also started singing from, <coughs> from my teachings. Oh, it is the same teaching. So we don't have enmity against one. We don't have we don't have any jealousy. We don't have any argument. We say understand it, realize it. That is more important. So for that, a seeker has to have a pure mind. Pure mind comes by listening and learning. Repeat listening and learning, contemplation and reflection, and then it results into non-attachment. Non-attachment results into dispassion. And once you have a level of dispassion, that is what you are experiencing. That level of dispassion gives you a sense of freedom. You know, I have changed my habit. You know, now there's less anxiety, less fear. Less sense of attachment is there. So what exactly listening and learning and repeat listening and learning does the blind belief paralyzes our intellect. So that is why we put a lot of argument with the cause and effect to make you understand. So that blind belief starts dissolving. You say I have a fear, it's a blind uh, belief. Where is the fear? Show me. But I cannot say directly, where <laughs> show me. I have to take your mind slowly, gradually, step by step, by one step. And then you say, oh, yes, yes, yes. Now, now I can see. Now I can understand. But if I say, there is no fear, then you will leave me. So no, I, you're right. So I have to make you understand. So the, the, these principles are there in our, <laughs> in our journey of the Eastern wisdom. And that is where lies the secret. Once you we get the niche of it, I know you get a niche of it, you can continue speaking for hours. You can write hundreds of books. Why? There's an instant natural revelation in your mind because clarity is there. All knowledge comes from the from inside. All knowledge comes from the inside. So you hit that center in your mental consciousness where the knowledge from the higher consciousness reveals and you know, oh, this is the way. But to reach to that state, we have to digest and assimilate the knowledge. We have to 
raise our awareness. We have to rise in consciousness. And that can only happen when we contemplate and reflect, when we practice meditation all the time. What, what would you call, like, uh, we started out this conversation, because I totally sense that fear is a blind belief, right? Like, where is the fear? Show me where the fear is. What, what would you what would you call like when I say sometimes my body feels anxious or uncomfortable like where is that still coming from a thought and is a thought about how I'm feeling you have five sensations which you label and claim that you have anxiety Without thought, you cannot label any sensation as an anxiety. Any sensation you cannot label as anxiety, you cannot label. So the moment you label, it is a thought. So there are two things. One is emotion. And the second is the experiencing thought. It's a very deeper principle. I'm teaching you from the another text. <laughs> yeah. So one is the anger, for example, and the other is the experiencing thought of an anger. These two are two different things. Now ask yourself, no, say sensuality <clears throat> is an emotion or is a feeling and experiencing thought of a sensuality. So emotion and the experiencing thought of that emotion both takes place in the mind. Both are taking place in the mind. When the mind lives in ignorance, it addresses one set of emotion as anxiety, other set of emotion as a sensuality, third set of emotion as anger, fourth set of emotion as a pleasure. Sensation or so-called feeling is the change of energy pattern in the body. It is the same energy. And anything that anything that changes is not real. Yeah, no, that is one thing. That is one teaching, one part of the teaching, other part of the teaching. After all, it is the same energy which becomes anger. It is the same energy which becomes the sensuality. It is the same energy which becomes the pleasure. <laughs> it's all the same energy. Energy is the same. Then how do we? Then why do? Then why do sometimes we say, "Oh, I'm happy, I'm sexually energized, or I'm anxious"? Is just depending on what we label the like the the what well, we attach the thought to. Yes. To reach to that state of understanding, plus one, plus two, the state of realization, then you realize when the mind falls into. When the mind falls into unconsciousness, that mind drives the energy to the lower centers. We have a fear center. We have a center of the sensuality or the sex. When the same mind with the energy rises up, reaches here or here, it becomes the experience of the peace and happiness. It is the same battery, it is the same electric you know, battery that charges your smartphone. It is the same electricity that, char that runs your AC. Outer form is different, then what? Energy is the same. Why the you, real self? Why you, uh -huh. why you label the energy is different? Energy is the same. Current is no, the same. Right. I didn't even think about that. <laughs> so energy goes down. Why it goes down? Because of the impurity of the mind. 
why there is impurity of the mind? The mind is saying, I will have a permanent happiness in this sexual activity. Where it is not, that is ignorance. So you are driving your mind there. You are driving your energy there. And every time you are frustrated, <clears throat> then you go for, what you go for? I, I don't remember. Those pills? What are those pills? I don't know. What pills? No, pills to I... energize your sexual activity. Oh, Viagra. <laughs> <laughs> so now, why you are dependent on Viagra, you are dependent on the energy that you are now your mind is bent upon to drive that energy into the lower consciousness. Do it. Do it. Nothing is going to happen. We say that happiness radiates like a fragrance all the time. Condition, you have to lift your mind to the higher state of the consciousness where the mind drops emotion one factor in the mind plus experiencing thought of the emotion so what happens you reach to the state of silence out of that silence reveals that happiness and first time you recognize oh happiness is my essential nature now you have recognized you have realized, you have experienced that happiness is my essential nature. What happens to now your sensuality and your sexual energy? The mind is not going there. Mind says, there is no comparison between a penny and a billion dollar. <laughs> I'm expressing in my own way. Penny is sensuality. Billion dollar. Oh, it's an un, unlimited source of the happiness. I'll be tired by doing the sexual activity. Every time I have experienced it, and I'm experiencing that happiness without getting tired. <laughs> so that is, that is the answer of another question that you, you might have in your mind. Yeah. Who cares? Who cares the penny? <laughs> the ignorant one. Ignorant one. So that, 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 that but uh, to, to reach to that state, it is such a, you know, I am earning a penny every month, for example, and I have oh. a dream of earning a billion dollar. So I have to bridge the gap of my effort, of my direction, of my practices. If I don't do the practice, if I don't listen and learn and contemplate and reflect on these principles, so I will remain confined to a penny. I will ask the wrong question. What is the wrong question? Uh, will I not go for this sex after I am awakened? First you awaken. Simple answer. First you awaken. And then I tell a lot of people, first you awake, and then they say, you did not answer my question. So your mind is already obsessed with that penny. What should I say? You, you are not in a sense of the detachment. You are not in a state of yeah. dispassion. So uh, you are asking a wrong question to a wrong guy. Wrong guy means that you should go to uh, those people uh, who are expert in... Uh, in this uh, sex matter. They will answer your question. But no, we don't answer openly, but we answer indirectly, okay, okay, you will have it, you still have it, there is no problem. Uh, after awakening, your organ, sex organs do not uh, <clears throat> disappear. So we, we answer totally in a no. different way. We answer... <laughs> So sometimes, you know, sometimes we have a serious uh, seekers and they ask these questions. We say, no, your organs will uh, continue to exist. You know, you need not to worry. Uh, first, be concerned about uh, the reaching to the higher state of the consciousness. Then see what happens. 
Because when, because when you reach the higher state of consciousness, you won't even be asking the questions. You, you, you will not be asking those questions. So you're asking those questions in ignorance because of the impurity of the mind, because you are already obsessed with it. You are trying to rationalize it. You are not putting a right reasoning. You are not looking at the permanent happiness versus the pleasure. So we, so, so we have many concepts and that's how we start teaching based on the temperament of an individual. We start teaching those uh, things. And that is why it takes a time. Yeah. So one master, another master says that first thing that you have to take over all the modifications of your mind. What is the modification? The thought process. Every time the mind has a thought, mind is modified. So that thought pertains to an object of the world outside. So mind is objectified. The mind continues to live in the world outside. So as long as the mind continues to live or, uh, outside because of the modifications of the mind, you cannot reach to that treasure. So then if the person, depending on the temperament of an individual, we judge it, we analyze it, we understand it, we read the thought, and then we say, okay, let us do this, let us follow this path. Why? Because tradition is so rich, it's so full of, full of the teachings, full of the teachings of the great masters. And if you have had all those teachings in your head, you know how to change the topic and how to take the mind of a person so that they become a seeker. Ultimately, yeah. we come to the one conclusion that real self is absolute existence, consciousness, and bliss. Yeah. And you are the real self. You are misidentifying yourself as a body-mind complex. You are identifying with yourself with a fear. That's why you feel scared. Otherwise, there is no reason to be feel scared. There's no reason at all. No, but I have many reasons. You are rationalizing. You are living in ignorance. Yeah. You are living in impurity. For the mind. And that is why, that is how we we, we take uh, the seeker to that journey again and again. We are not saying that you leave uh, your profession, you leave your what you are doing, you keep on doing what you are doing. Buddha did the, yeah. Buddha left the kingdom for seven years and he said there is no need to leave the kingdom. But he left the kingdom and so why he was totally committed to the journey. Yeah. So without leaving anything, what you are doing, you should be committed to the journey. So you are a Buddha. You see the... I am committed. So you, you are seeing the you seeing the reasoning and the logic. So every master says yeah. no need to go to the Himalaya, stand on one foot. Do the fasting, but understand. Understanding is very important. And reflection, and followed by the practice. Why you practice? Because you get rid of those impurities of the mind. They should not be repeated. And when they are no, mind is not repeating any impurity, then you are already awakened. Why? You are the real self. At present, all these thoughts of anxiety, fear, are have made their houses in the mind. Now all those houses are destroyed. What is left? The real self cannot be destroyed. So the real self will be replaced, naturally. Gurdjieff, I have to jump on a, a Make-A-Wish call right now for a volunteer.